we are uh, studying today regarding the inexcusable man and we have had one lesson in this and and concluded in the middle of page 36 God very explicitly says in Romans 2 and 1 thou art inexcusable human person whoever you are especially you the judge we're going to get in further into that part of it wherein thou judgest another thou condemnest thyself for thou judgest that judges do it the same thing. That's so true in the law courts of our country. The men that are sitting there judging others are just as guilty as the person they're talking to. And even the judges themselves are guilty of the same thing. They're bringing a verdict down upon someone else. And uh, one day the great judges of the universe will take over. And it'll be a different story. Can you say amen? Uh, we, we have studied page 35. That... All men uh, have rebelled against the authority of God, and they have done it very, very deliberately. And in our country, in the last generation especially, we have been taught that the poor little innocent heathen, that they don't know anything, and that they should not be judged like we are judged. And it happens that you don't know the heathen, but I do. And I have talked to the heathen. I've talked to men and women that never wore clothes, that, that ate their meat raw, kill a cow and eat the hind leg without cooking it any. And I talked to those people. I says, is it wrong for you to take somebody else's wife? And they said, yeah, that's wrong. I said, yeah, that's what we came to teach you about here in the book. If a man has two little animals and you take one, is that wrong? Yeah, oh, that's, that's wrong. That's, that's, that's what the book's all about. And you come to find out they know all of the commandments. Oh, you say they don't know about God. Oh, yes, they do. I said, what do you worship? He says, that tree. Why do you worship it? It has leaves on it and it shelters me. Uh -huh. Who made the tree? I don't know. Would you like to know the man that made the tree? Oh, oh, yes. That's who I come to talk to you about. So they know there's someone there. They haven't become identified with him yet. And so the Bible says... You're inexcusable, old man, whosoever you are. You have no, in any part of the world, from the highest mountain to the lowest valley, you have no excuse. And especially you folks that live in this area, you don't have any. We were studying point number two, that God judges man according to truth. You ought to be glad for that, because that's the only true judgment there will ever be on this earth. In Romans 2 and 2, it says, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth. Now, the purpose of the great white throne judgment is this. First, if you went down to the city jail today, and it's packed full of people, and you'd say, should you be here? He'd say, oh, no, I shouldn't be here. Do you think you ought to be here? No, I shouldn't be here. They're pleading their own innocence, you know, no matter what they've done. Well, somebody else caused me to do that, and I shouldn't be here. And that's the way it is in hell today. Almost all the people in hell are complaining, saying, we shouldn't be here. We shouldn't be here. After all, I belong to the church for 50 years. Why should I be here? And that's the purpose of the great white throne judgment, where every human from Adam to the Antichrist will be there. And the Bible says in Revelation, the books should be open. And God will take each person in his infinite mercy and show them their lives, their thought life and their physical life of what they've done. And the secret things, he will show them to them. Then he'll say, are you a transgressor? Yes. And you know that hell is made for transgressors? Yes. Then you know that you should go there, don't you? Yes. In the lake of fire, there'll be no complainers. When you get to the ultimate judgment, every person will know that he has been judged according to truth and not a lie and not by a false witness. He will be his own witness. There'll be no other witness but him and the record, the divine record that God keeps in heaven. 
You say, hey, Brother Sorrow, I'd like to get rid of that record. You can. Isn't that nice? The Lord Jesus Christ is your attorney at law. The Bible calls him your advocate. And you can come to him and say, I have sinned. I have broken the law of God. I'm sorry for it. Could I be forgiven? He'll say, yes, by my blood, you can be forgiven. I'd like to receive that forgiveness, please. And so he lays his beautiful hand upon you and says, be clean. <laughs> and it all goes away. And then up in heaven, they've got some beautiful erasers for, for ink. And they go through and they rub out all the bad things you have done. And then you look at the page and it's all clear. There's nothing there anymore. You have already been judged by Calvary, by the sacrifice of Jesus. He paid the debt that you could not pay. And so he erased the sin that you could not erase. And now all you have to do is to walk in the love of God and in the truth of God. Can you say amen? And so in Romans 2 and 2, you should mark it, that all judgment is according to truth. Now, you know, and we all know that we live in a world where it's almost impossible to get honest judgment. There's so many people that will tell untruths. There's so many people that will not tell you what they know. And so you cannot get a true judgment. That will not be true because in John 8 and 15, it says, ye judge after the flesh, the eyes, the mouth. But I judge no man. What Jesus Christ says in that order he doesn't judge anybody but God judges in Romans 8 and 16 that is the next verse from the one you're just reading yet if I judge my judgment is true true judgment for I am not alone but I and the Father that sent me would you like to say that word with me right now I and the Father who sent me you think there are two? If you think there's two, hold up two fingers. All right. I hate to call you stupid so early in the morning. I could do it later in the evening, but uh, so early in the morning, I'm reading you the Word of God, and you're not listening, you see. So when you get away from the class, you won't know what's been taught. There's a God the Father that is a person all of his own, and there's a God the Son who is a person all of his own. And he says, if, and yet if I judge you, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. Are you here? Now, are there two? All right. And then Jesus said, I will send you another comforter. And when he, say he, when he is come, you know, he will guide us into all truth. And so there we have three. That is the reason we teach what we do is because the Bible teaches it. You say, oh, but the Bible says the Father and the Son are one. Yeah, the Bible also says my wife and I are one. She's down there and I'm up here. Are you here or not? Okay, I'll get started then. We can be thankful that when we stand before God that we will be adjudged by perfect truth, intense truth, absolute truth, and, uh, and not by lies, and not by deceptions, and not by half knowledge. If a person only knows half of the problem, he can't, he can't possibly give you a righteous judgment. That's the reason when a man and a wife are having trouble, and you want to talk to one of them, you've only seen one side of the coin. Caesar's head's on the other side, you ought to look at him too. I don't know whether you're here or not. You need both parties if you want full truth. It don't matter how sincere you are, you are sincerely for yourself. It will not be half truth or part truth or hidden truth. We will be judged in the final judgments of this human race, of the life that you're living here, fully and completely by the lives that we have lived, we will be judged for it. The deeds we have done and by the things we have even thought. Our judgment will be according to who we really are. Now, in, in 1 Corinthians 4 and 5, it says, Therefore, 
judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. He will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of their hearts. Will make manifest the counsels of their hearts and then shall every man have praise of God. When the whole thing is brought out and it is clear, then we'll know who is who and what is what and where is where. There won't be any difficulty knowing who stands high before the throne of God at that time. So it is a lot better to let God be the judge. How many believe that? Let God be the judge of all mankind and let us just be the servants of the Lord. Now that is what I live by right there. I refuse to judge people. I will not go to a funeral and start putting this man in heaven and the other one in another place. For the simple reason, I don't know exactly where they are anyway. Oh, but says he was a good church member and he wasn't. And that, that, don't make, that don't make the difference, you see. You can be a good church member and not be a good Christian. How many believe that? Yeah, you can be faithful to a church and not be faithful to God. And there are a lot of people like that. And, and so we're not judges. I'm not a judge. I'm a servant. I'm trying to get into the same place you're working on. And that's heaven. How many are still working on it? Yeah, because my, my, my whole inner being says, I'm going to make it to heaven. And I want to live and conform every day that I will do it. So it's a lot better to let God be the judge. In 1 Corinthians 4 and 1, it says, Let a man so account to us as of the ministers of Christ and the stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards. That's what we are. We're all stewards of the Lord. That a man be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you. Or that of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. Now, there's one of the great scriptures. I don't ever call myself good. <laughs> no, I don't do that. That's God's business. God, God knows whether my intents in me are right or wrong. God knows whether it's personal ambition or the ambition for the kingdom on the inside. And, and, and what other people say doesn't move me at all because they don't know my insides. Only God knows my insides. And maybe I don't correctly know my insides. And so I have to leave all judgment up to the Lord as to who I am and what I am. All I must do is strive to be a good servant. Can you say amen? All right. At the top of page 37, God's judgment is against transgressors and it's against transgression. You, you, when you know that, you're in the right position. If you think you're a pet of God and that you can do sneaky little things and he'll let you by, but he wouldn't let the deacon by. But you can get by with it. But Sister Pudig, she can't get by with it. Now you see, you're completely wrong. God has no pets. God doesn't love you, your blue eyes anymore than he does brown eyes. And, and so you've got to know that, well, let's look at Romans 2 and 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest for. Wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself for that thou judgest that judges, you do the same things. You're saying, oh, you're, you're, you talk too much. Well, you do too. Oh, you criticize too much. Well, you do too. Who are you that judges? And you do the same things. And that's where God wants us to be very careful. Verse 2 says, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which, which commit such things. So Paul had sternly rebuked the heathen and the pagans in chapter 1 and, and uh, we have gone through that very carefully in chapter 1 now he rebukes the religious people at that point they were the Jewish people who had been so judgmental they had been so judgmental of all Gentiles so in Romans 2 and 1 he says and thinkest thou this old man that judgeth them which do such things that's talking about chapter 1 and thou doest the same? Thou 
shall, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? He says, you're not going to escape. You will not escape. Many times we think that a physical sin is very bad, especially religious people do. That if a man commits adultery, we feel he's done a terrible thing, an awful thing, an unforgivable thing. We don't even want to forgive him. If a minister falls in adultery, nobody ever wants him to preach anymore, you see. But we do not feel that lying is so bad. No amens. Okay, I can live without amens, but uh, if you think that you can lie, but you don't commit adultery and that you're a good person, you better talk to God. He has another idea about you. You're in a state of rebellion against his fabric of holiness that holds the universe together. If a man steals, we, we think it's an awful thing. Oh, that man's a thief. Look, at there he stole. But however, if he is deceitful to his neighbor, well, we think that's all right. Well, that's not too bad, you see. But God hates sin on the inside of you just as much as he hates sin on the outside of you. But we hate sin on the outside because people can see it. And sin on the inside, we love it, you know. I have a right to judge my preacher. I have a right to judge my usher. If I were to publish all the letters that are sent to me, man, I could sell that book for $500 a copy. Especially if I put your name at the end of the letter. I seldom ever get a letter telling me that I'm a nice person. Seldom ever. People that like me don't write to me. But it's the others. <laughs> Three and four and five and six pages. Telling me how wrong I am because I don't do this or that and the other. And, and, and it usually has nothing to do, nothing to do with the outside. Just with the, has nothing to do with the inside, but the outside of people, you see. And that same person is so critical of them and critical of me, you see. You'd be amazed at the people that write to me and say, I'm not going to give you any more money. I mean, this happens every week. I'm not going to give you any more money. I'm not going to bless your ministry anymore because of what you said in the pulpit. Honey, sometimes I can't help what I say in the pulpit. i got to say something. Okay. I'm not perfect. If you don't think, don't believe it, ask my wife. She'll tell you I'm not perfect. The internal sins are much worse than the external ones because in Matthew 23 and 28, even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but inwardly you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. That's in your Bible. That is in your Bible. And so God is searching our insides and he's saying, thou art inexcusable, man, whoever you are. You're in, you don't have an excuse for not loving me and serving me and walking with me. So when God cleans up a person, he begins on the inside. A number of years ago, I was preaching in a certain town, and, and uh, I was invited out to dinner. It was a little further south. And the lady cooked some most wonderful chicken. While she was cooking it, she walked into the room where I was reading the Bible and said something. And I looked up, and in her cooking, she had swabbed the side of her face with, 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 with grease, with, uh, with black grease. And, it, and I didn't want to say, lady, the side of your face, you, you put your hand up there after you touch the stove, you got black on your face. You know, you can't hardly say that. You're looking forward to a chicken dinner in a few minutes. We went ahead and had dinner and went to church and, and she sat right down to the front and, and I was preaching and I, I gasped. There she was. She had powdered over the top of the grease and in the warmth of the meeting, the powder was wearing off and the, and the grease was shining through. You see? Now, when man wants to cover, he always takes whitewash. 
But when Jesus wants to bless you, he washes white. And there's a mighty big difference between whitewashing and washing white. Washing white begins on the inside of cleaning out. Whitewashing is putting something on top of something. And when that something wears off, you got something underneath. And I never want to be held guilty of whitewashing people saying, oh, you're all right. I want to see you wash white and say, everybody knows you're all right. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In 1 Corinthians 5 and, 12 and 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, and old things have passed away, and all things become new. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You ought to mark that one real good. That's what it means about being a Christian. That if you're in Christ, say in Christ, new creature, old things, wickedness, passed away. New things have come to reside on the inside of us. So the riches of God's goodness to man are available. He can be washed in the blood of the Lamb. In Romans 2 and 4, it says, it says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and the forbearance and the long suffering? Uh, now, pause and look back a little bit. The first word there, despiseth. Are you going to look down upon, are you going to criticize the, the, the riches of God's goodness and the riches of God's forbearance and the riches of God's long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads men to repentance? The goodness of God causes a man to say, hey, I want to be like God. I want to be, I want to be a good person. Now, it it is easy, you know, to despise, or set it not, the riches of God, the goodness of God. We, can, we cannot appreciate breathing until you're in a hospital, gasping for breath, your last breath. Then you wish you could breathe like you did when you were a little child, you see. But you, you can't sometimes say, oh, thank God for my breath. I've heard very few people ever thank God for their breath, except in hospitals where they don't have any left. And then they start thanking God for it. I tell the story here in your C uh, that, that is very uh, interesting to me. I was in Java, and a Dutch banker that we were staying with took us to see a live volcano. And, and I went out over a ledge looking down into the abyss as it belched up from hell. This, this awful lava. And I just wanted to see it close. And the ledge that I was out on had been eaten away underneath by the volcano, the fire, and I didn't know it. It was green and beautiful, and I was just there looking into the heart of a volcano. And suddenly, like an elevator. How many have been on an elevator and you couldn't tell whether you were going up or down? Huh? You were just going, you see. Something began to move. And it was where I was kneeling out there looking inside. I was physically going down into the midst of hell, in the, in the, in, 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 in the midst of a, a live volcano that was belching 50 foot high, pure fire from the inner parts of the earth. But it happened that a Dutch banker was watching me with great eagerness. He'd looked in these places before, and he had seen hunks of earth fall into the, into the crater before. I had never seen it. He was right behind me. When he saw the earth give away, he didn't scream. He didn't cry. If he had, I might have jumped into the volcano out of fright. He did nothing but reach and get a hold of my coat. He put his heels down like this. And with great strength, he did a great oval like this. I was away in the sky. And he brought me down 10 foot behind him and there we both lay and I looked and a place as big as two grand pianos was gone into the abyss and I said sir I'm so thankful now that's all God wants out of you that's what God wants out of you can't you be thankful 
and grateful to God our sins are gone and we're saved Jesus saved us from the abyss of hell with his own might with his own strength he saved us when we could not save ourselves Jesus saved us and he says be thankful and be grateful